tonight on Unsolved Mysteries. In Venice, California, a late night trip to the corner store becomes a terrifying descent into an urban hell, which ends in a brutal death for the son of a prominent television actor. When Millie McGregor got hopelessly lost in the wilderness, an army of highly trained searchers was mobilized for the rescue effort. But they had no luck until a soft-spoken cowboy, guided by a mysterious vision, came riding along. For years, Tim Harrell was told he'd been abandoned by his birth mother, left as an infant in a garbage can. Too late, Harrell learned that the tale had been a tragic, misguided deception concocted by his adoptive mother. And in one of our most bizarre cases, a self-styled preacher allegedly brainwashes a young farmer and turns him into a virtual prisoner in his own home. Join me. Perhaps you hold the key. Perhaps you may be able to solve one of tonight's unsolved mysteries. Actor Dennis Cole has appeared in dozens of television shows like The Young and the Restless, Fantasy Island, and The Fall Guy. If life was scripted like a Hollywood movie, Dennis's only son Joe might have followed in his footsteps. But Joe Cole died unexpectedly, barely out of his 20s. I have like 29 years of remembering of doing all of these things. I mean, I was a kid, I was a teenager when he was born. There's not a day that goes by that uh, I don't think about him. And, uh, you know, I've, we've always shared things. It's like I, I've done a lot of new things, and it's like I have no one to call up and say, hey, hey, Joe, guess what happened here? And, and he would do the same thing with me. I mean, it's like a part of your heart was just taken and pulled out. There is no good way to lose a child. Sudden random violence is one of the worst. An unknown gunman shot Joe Cole during a holdup that netted less than $50. He was murdered in front of his home in Venice, California, near one of the most violent sections of Los Angeles. But Venice hides its troubles well. Indeed, this beachfront suburb is a scene of a year-round street party. For decades, the area has been home to writers, artists, and musicians. Joe Cole, an actor and a photographer fit right in. In Venice, Joe Cole set himself the task of documenting the plight of homeless Vietnam veterans. Cole was helped by his longtime friend, Henry Rollins, a writer and lead singer of the Rollins Band. Those men you see talking to themselves, standing next to pay phones on streets, he would bond with these people where they wouldn't give you the time of day, they would tell the story of their lives to Joe. Joe Cole was murdered before he could complete the work. At the time, he and Rollins were renting a house just outside Oakwood, the toughest part of Venice. Looking back, Rollins has a less than innocent view of life on the edge. You get in your little rituals when you live in a community. You go, you know, wash days Friday, chicken on Sunday, all that. And for a predator, for a robber, this is what they go on. They need habit. What do you mean? It's a great flick. He shoots down like it was Rollins and Cole's habit to shop at an all-night grocery store a block from their house. Their visit on December 19th, 1991 was forgettably ordinary until they got to within 50 feet of their front door. This is home, cabbage. Hey, come on. OK, put it back down. Put it back down. Don't look at me! Don't look at me! Within one second, you are going from the 90 millionth trip to the grocery store home 
two, two guns in your face. And, you know, your reality changes very abruptly. Don't look at me! Everything seemed to go very slowly, and time seemed to kind of hover. One robber shoved Rollins to his knees. The other forced Joe Cole face down on the ground. The guy who was on me said, if you yell or if you scream, I'm going to blow your head off. And I said, OK. Yo, you scream, I'll kill him, OK? What zoomed through my mind was, if I speak loud, the gun will go off. And if I whisper, maybe it won't. What's what he got? And the gun is very delicate and has a life of its own. And if I'm cool, maybe it won't jump out and bite me. 40 bucks. This is it? This is all you got? That's yes. all you got? Yes. Get up. Get up. Let's get, get him in the house. I'm going to your house. I'm going to your house. Get the bag. 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 Put your hands down, punk. Everybody go notes. Anybody home? My roommate's home. He's watching TV. I lied, hoping they would go, oh, people in the house, we better get out of here. But that didn't bother him at all. I'm trying to come up with some kind of way to get us out of this. Because it's not as if you're going to go for some movie stunt like grabbing the gun and wrestling around. That's, you know, that's fiction. And at that moment, what I thought was going to happen was we were going to be marched into the house and executed while they robbed the place uh, at their leisure. I heard feet scuffling on the front porch. And then I heard gunshots. And I remember standing there very, you know, perfectly still with my hands up for a couple of seconds afterwards, thinking how strange gunshots sounded inside this room as they, the sound ricocheted around the walls. And then my legs took off. But I did not know the state that Joe was in. I, had, I didn't even hardly remember leaving the house. All of a sudden, I was at a phone, and I called the police and told them what I thought had happened. 60 pounds, scruffy. Though the police arrived within minutes, Joe Cole was already dead, and the killers had melted into the night. My partner and myself have put in thousands of hours interviewing hundreds and hundreds of people. Our investigation uh, has led us to believe that the suspects probably uh, live in the Oakwood community. Criminals always talk, and they talk to other people. Somebody knows something out there that happened uh, to Joe Cole. When someone dies in this way, it's not just the loss of a life. There's a mother, there's a father, you know, and then all of us, the friends, who lost this fantastic person. And you never recover from it all the way. You always carry some of it in you, and it, it wrecks you year after year. As mutilated a concept as justice is in this country, and how it only seems to benefit a certain skin color and a certain um, economic uh, place in America, Real justice is a pretty righteous thing, and I'd like to see it done and exacted on these individuals. The only justice that can be done here is to get those guys or guy off the street so they don't do it to your friend or your sister or your parent or your child. In a moment, Keely Shea Smith joins us with the latest news from the phone center. Also, a veteran journalist needs your help to unlock the secrets of his past.
Tonight, we have a heartwarming update to one of our most poignant lost love cases. Perhaps you remember the story. A few days after Christmas in 1961, a diesel engine rumbled out of Dallas, Texas, and headed west. Nearly 200 miles down the line in Abilene, Texas, Darlene Alfano and a friend gathered up their children for a trip into town. The train reached Abilene at the same time as the two mothers and their children. Inexplicably, their car came to a sudden dead stop at the railroad crossing. The accident killed three children and one of the mothers. That anyone at all came out of the wreckage alive seemed a miracle. Fred Alfano, a U.S. Army sergeant, lost his wife and two of his daughters in the crash. His third child, LaDonna, suffered massive head injuries. What happened to Mommy? Mommy's an angel. She sure is. Over the years, LaDonna endured a succession of operations that gradually rebuilt her face. But of course, nothing could restore her sisters or her mother, Darlene. I have no memories of my mother at all. Um, I look at pictures of her and I try to remember something. And it's like looking at a, a magazine article of a woman. My father has told me stories about us as children with my mom, and it doesn't bring back any memories whatsoever. None whatsoever. LaDonna's only hope of finding her mother's family rested with this 28-year-old snapshot of her mother's sister, Patricia Hintz. Keeley was at the phone center as the dramatic story unfolded. Bob, the night of our broadcast, LaDonna's search came to a glorious end. In fact, it was more successful than she ever dared hope for. Not only did she find her Aunt Patricia, but she located her maternal grandparents as well. Before the evening was out, plans were underway for a long overdue family reunion. A few weeks later, LaDonna was pulling up to her Aunt Pat's house in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. Hi. Hi. Oh, it's been good. Oh, you're just quirky. <laughs> Don't cry. Don't I'm, I'm, thank you. So do you. Thank you. It's totally changed my life. Do you believe it? Yeah, I believe, I believe it. it. It's just finding them, and they're great people, and <laughs> they're beautiful. I just, I'm, I just feel totally, my, that hole, the empty hole is totally filled. She lost her mother. I lost my sister. And it's just like, she found a, another mother, and I found a new sister. And I just feel like, I just feel like we're just connected. I really do. Doesn't she look like that? LaDonna's first visit with her grandparents in more than three decades made the reunion complete. I can't even express it. I just really cannot express how I feel. There's just too many emotions going on here, and it's just a wonderful, wonderful feeling. It's just, it's great. I just feel like I'm... I just feel really like I'm at home. It's really great. And DJ from LA. Hi. LaDonna's joyous rediscovery of her mother's family was tempered by an unexpected loss. Two days after the reunion, LaDonna's grandfather, Stanley Hintz, passed away. He was 86 years old. Tim Harrell, a news producer at a Los Angeles television station, is a veteran journalist, a man whose 30-year career has earned him numerous awards and commendations. Tim has covered thousands of stories, but for the last six years, one story has been a priority. Now Tim Harrell needs your help. Yeah, hi, Bill. Tim Harrell over Channel 13 News. It's so frustrating to know that here I am. I can go out and get good stories. I can break stories. I can do great interviews. I can get nominated for Emmys, I can win awards, but I can't find my mother. 
Tim was raised by a woman named Helen Harrell. She never made a secret of the fact that Tim was adopted, and she never shielded him from the near tragic circumstances that she said brought him to her in 1947. She told me that she had found me abandoned in a garbage can behind Barnes Hospital in St. Louis before she worked as a nurse. And that when she found me, um, I was very sick. I had a birth defect known as a cleft palate and a hair lip. And uh, she took me in and uh, had a uh, plastic surgeon repair that. Uh, I also had rheumatic fever, which was uh, a heart problem where I had a heart murmur as well. And she took care of that. Helen managed to adopt the baby at a time when single parenthood was almost unheard of. Somehow she was able to cut through the red tape. She always was concerned that there was never a male force in my life. So she made sure I was in military school. She made sure I was in the YMCA. She made sure I was in Little League, and she went to these things with me. I mean, she went to the Little League games with me. She went to the YMCA with me. Uh, she took the role of being father and mother. Mom, I want to be a news reporter when I grow up. Inevitably, however, the day came when Tim wanted to know more about his past. Mom? Yes? What happened to my mother? What on earth are you talking about? I'm your mother. I mean, what happened to my real mother? Timmy, your mother was not a good mother. She and your father were low class. Trashy. Her favorite term no for them was white trash. No way of taking care of you. I just hated my birth mother. I thought, my God, how could a, a human being just throw away a baby, particularly one who had a physical defect, and, and, and just throw him in the garbage like it was a piece of garbage? I mean, that just gnawed away at me. Uh, and as I got into journalism, as I did stories about mothers who abandoned their children, you know, I, I always lumped my birth mother in with them. And they were always usually people that were low class, that, uh, that had no caring for their children. And I would always identify my birth mother with those, those people. By 1976, Tim was on staff at the Los Angeles Herald Examiner. He was married and had a son of his own. That summer, Tim received a phone call that haunts him to this day. Desk. May I speak to Tim Harrell? Speaking, who's calling? This is your mother. Excuse me, what are you talking about? My mother's at home. This is your mother, your real mother. It came right out of the blue like a this bolt of lightning. Joke. I mean, I've been through riots, I, I covered things in Vietnam, but that just was the most emotional thing that I've ever had in my life to, to get that phone call. Don't you think it's a little late to suddenly be taking an interest in my life? I'm sorry about what I did to you, but there are things you don't understand. And what I do understand is you left me to die in a trash can. All of what a sudden, kind of all the hatred a baby in a just trash exploded. Can. I said, how could you? How could you throw me away like I was a piece of garbage? How could you do that? And uh, she said, well, you don't understand. And I said, I don't want to understand. I'd like to see my grandson. There's no way you're ever going to see my son. If you ever try to contact me or my son, I'll get a restraining order against you. I don't owe you a thing. All the emotions just flowed out of me. The uh, city editor who was working there looked at me, and he says, my god, what's wrong? You look like you've seen a ghost, and I told him I have. She said she was living near San Jose, and she wanted to meet Adam. How did she find you? Later that day, I told Helen about the phone call. And she got hysterical. You're not going to try and see her, are you? Of course not. I have no interest in seeing her or my father. I told him to stay away from my family. Tim, promise me you will not try to find her. She abandoned you when you were a baby. Nothing good can come out of you meeting her. Helen's reaction solidified Tim's decision not to allow his birth mother into his life. Six years later, in 1983, Helen passed away. By then, Tim had divorced, and his son had gone to live with Tim's ex-wife. It was a lonely time, a moment when Tim became acutely aware of how much family meant to him. In 1986, Tim married his second wife, Denise, but he couldn't shake the feeling that something was missing. 
On a trip back to St. Louis in 1990, Tim and Denise tried to locate his birth mother through adoption records. You realize, Mr. Harold, that I'm not at liberty to divulge any information regarding your adoption. I don't know where else to go. I'm sorry, but it's the law. And she said adoptions in, in Missouri are confidential. And we played sort of a game of uh, 20 questions, if you will. She says, think Bay Area. And I said, San Francisco? She says, no, a little further south. And I said, San Jose? She said, yes. She says, think relative of your mother, of your adoptive mother. Well, couldn't think of who that would be. Does your mother have a sister? Are you saying that my real mother was Helen's sister? I'm not saying anything. Listen, I'm gonna go get a cup of coffee. Seems silly to put this away, just to get it out again later. I'm gonna be gone for about five minutes. In those five minutes, Tim learned Helen had lied about every detail of his birth. Don't believe it. His birth mother was not some cold-hearted stranger who would abandon him in a garbage can. His name was Muriel Carroll. She was apparently Helen's own niece, and she had given Tim up only because she had to. It went through me like a, a jolt of electricity. The only thought in my mind was, is I really wanted to find her now. I really wanted to say, look, I didn't know. And I am so sorry. I am so sorry for what I said to you and, and how I acted to you. Tim was deeply moved to learn that Helen's niece was only 18 when he was born, still almost a child herself. Tim's father had just gotten out of the army and was in no position to be both a husband and father. They gave Tim to Helen and bowed out of his life. It aches at my heart to know that I have a family out there. And I don't know who they are. I'm trying to look at Muriel Carroll, uh, who may have lived in the St. Louis area back in 1947 or so. I have to find this woman. Even if it turns out that she has died, uh, I want to go to the grave. I want to talk to her. I didn't give her an opportunity to explain. Uh, here I am, a journalist. I'm supposed to be fair. I'm supposed to be even-handed. I'm supposed to listen to both sides. And I wouldn't even give my real mother the opportunity to explain what happened. Uh, I, 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 to this day, I'm very worried that I don't have that opportunity. Coming up, when an elderly woman gets lost in the Sierra Nevadas, it seems that only a miracle can save her. But first, Dave Freeman posed as a hardworking man of God. But when his employer turned up dead, Freeman emerged as a prime suspect. November 14, 1994, Folsom, West Virginia. Acting on an anonymous tip, police arrive at the house of a well-to-do farmer named Tim Good. The tip had come from an unlikely source. A would-be thief had broken in and found more than he bargained for. The caller had said, look in the basement. Police came across what appeared to be sparse living quarters. On the bed, a grisly discovery, the decomposed body of 37-year-old Tim Good. Good had been strangled and left undisturbed for over a year. Where the body was located, it was basically a dungeon or a cell, uh, bare walls, concrete floor. Upstairs of the, the residence, it was lavishly furnished, a hot tub jacuzzi, three large screen TVs, a wet bar, it was very nice upstairs, and it was a dungeon in the basement. Pretty strange, huh? 
Yeah, sure is. What's the story on this here? The investigation quickly revealed that someone had been living in the house almost the entire time that Tim Good's dead body had been in the basement. All of the air vents were sealed, no doubt to prevent odors from wafting upstairs. Then police uncovered volumes of diaries written by this man, who was known as Dave Freeman. It was Freeman's cryptic writings that would help authorities piece together the tragic demise of Tim Good. Tim Good owned and operated a 350-acre dairy farm in Collinsville, Pennsylvania. One of his workers was a young man named Gene Kennedy. Kennedy had come from a broken home, and Tim was his unofficial guardian. When I first come to live with Tim, instead of making it feel like he was just giving it to me, it was like I was learning something, you know. 13 years old, 50 bucks a week, and being on your own and a place to live, that was pretty neat for me. The author of the diaries, Dave Freeman, hired on in 1987. I don't know. Um, At the time, he went by the name Ben. Here. I found some cooling in the oil pan. I'm getting ready to take this filter off and see if it's contaminated. But uh, Within so. months, Freeman and his wife Eliza had moved into the main house with Tim and Jean. For years. My father wants to hang on to this. Before you know it, it's he was there. It's just how it was. You know, Tim never even hinted that he knew, even liked Ben. I think in the beginning, he didn't. Tim, I was wondering. Yeah, man. I'm going to be leading a Bible study up at the house later this evening. Thought you might like to come up and check it out. By what time? Freeman was something of a self-styled preacher. Tim Good was estranged from his family and apparently turned to Freeman for spiritual guidance. Things to help you out with other people. Maybe ben would have an unusual twist to the way he spoke with Tim, uh, implying that he knew more than what most people did, and therefore Tim looked at him as being a very wise man. I think it started off that Tim thought he found somebody he could trust, you know, somebody that was pretty well educated that would more or less stick with him instead of everybody else turning him away. And I think that's what Tim wanted and needed. But Freeman seemed to have his own agenda. Gene Kennedy claims that Freeman began acting as if he owned the farm. What are you doing? I told you don't come here until you call. I live here, too. Yeah, well, you can't come in right now. I'll be in and out, all right? Look, my wife's asleep upstairs. You can't come I'll in. I'll be quiet. Get, get, get you little. I told you. Hey, what are you guys doing? Knock it off. Just back off, Ben, OK? My wife's asleep upstairs. Look, I understand that, but he lives here, too. OK? Yeah. What's going on? Look, just forget about him, all right? Come on, let's go inside. Sure, it's all right? It's OK, trust me. Come on. When Ben showed up, it wasn't, I'd say, about a year after that, Tim stopped dairy farm. You know, you come down on the farm, there was no cows. There was no calves. There was no dry stock. Everything was empty. Tim looked at me one day, and he said, you're going to hate me. He says, I sold the farm. He says, I got a million dollars for the farm, maybe a little more. <laughs> and he'd laugh. He thought that was really funny. He was real proud of himself. Here you go, ben. Be careful. This is a heavy one. Okay. Tim turned around and bought another much smaller farm in West Virginia. Gene Kennedy stayed in Pennsylvania. But Freeman and his family made the move with Tim. Oddly, Freeman was now calling himself Dave. Hey, Tim. How about when you're done with that, clearing some more of that land over by the fence? Over by that big tree? Yeah. And you know what? Come to think of it, when you're done with clearing that, why don't you get some of that wood over there for kindling? How much do you think we'll need? Tim would be oh, always out doing the work, and Dave would have. always be at the house. You know, the Lord says, the man that doesn't work doesn't eat. It seemed more like Dave was the boss. Instead of Tim being the one that owned it, it seemed more like Dave was. The living arrangements reflected this strange role reversal. Freeman's diaries revealed that while he and his family lived comfortably upstairs, Tim Good became a virtual prisoner in the basement. Please bless this food and please watch over me. The diaries were very detailed. He indicated in the diaries what chores Timothy Good was to perform that day. He even indicated what Timothy Good was to eat that day, if he was allowed to eat that day. 
every aspect of Timothy Good's life was controlled by Dave Friedman. I'm studying, man, like you told me to do. Is that what I told you to do? Is there anything else I told you to do, Tim? You told me to clean the basement. That's right, I told you to clean the basement. Get up here. When did I tell you to clean that basement? Yesterday. Yesterday? Every single day, Tim did something that would irritate or disgust uh, Dave Friedman. You see? It's just my shoes, Ben. That's all. Just your shoes. Basically, Timothy Good couldn't do anything That's correct. And everything that he did was a mistake or it wasn't God's way to do it. God requires that you pray. Oh, I'm sorry, Ben. When I first met Tim, he used to come to my house all the time. We were every day seeing each other and talked every day. We talked a lot about farming and stuff, and he was going to get his farm cleaned up and do a lot of work to it and everything. But uh, then at the end, Tim just started staying away from me. In fact, George Anderson did not see Tim Good or Dave Freeman for about a year. He assumed they had left the area. Then one afternoon in October of 1994, a taxi cab came up the road, headed for Tim Good's farm. My grandkids was out in the yard, and they seen him, and they started hollering at me and telling me Dave and Liza was back. And so and I told them that I was going up and talk to Dave and find out about Tim, because Tim had been going for about a year. The road to the farmhouse is blocked by a fallen tree, so Freeman had gone up on foot. Hey, George, how's it going, buddy? How are you, man? Oh, I was just up the house. It looked like somebody broke in the back window. All right, have you seen Tim? No, I asked no. him where Tim was at, and he said he hadn't seen Tim for a long time, and he had no idea. But he said he had walked up to the house, and uh, somebody had broke in the kitchen door. And he said he opened the door and looked in, and he said that's as far as he went. I believe that Dave Freeman came back to the Good Farm to remove the diaries. And I believe that they were surprised by the neighbors. And there's no way that he could have removed anything from the home without the neighbors observing that. Later that day, George Anderson's son-in-law gave Freeman and his family a ride to Washington, D.C. He dropped them off at a service station along the Beltway. They have not been seen since. Two weeks later, police discovered the decomposed remains of Tim Good. Grocery receipts indicated that Freeman and his family had lived in the house for approximately seven months after Good's death. They apparently left when they ran out of money. Good's bank account, which had previously held almost a million dollars, now contained less than two dollars. Dave Freeman indicated in his diaries that Timothy Good questioned him about the money and Dave Freeman was starting to realize that he didn't quite have the control on Timothy Good that he had once had. And I believe that that quite possibly led to his de demise. Next, tragedy seemed inevitable when a massive search for a lost hiker yielded nothing. Then a quiet cowboy rode to the rescue, apparently spurred on by a divine vision. The Sierra Nevadas in Northern California have changed little since the first pioneers came through 150 years ago. Today, the steep trails are the province of weekend explorers like 63-year-old Millie McGregor. Despite a mild heart condition, Millie thinks no more of an all-day 10-mile trek than she would a stroll to the corner grocery store. But when she set out on Labor Day in 1995, Millie never expected she would take a wrong turn into a life and death ordeal. And she certainly never expected a near magical rescue. It seemed like it started off good, had a good trail. And a ways back, that trail split off to two places, and I'd picked out the one I thought I should go on. I was probably several hours, maybe more like three hours, 
beginning to climb, and I, I got chest pain. Perhaps it was the altitude, perhaps the exertion. For some reason, Millie's heart medication made her queasy and disoriented. Before she knew it, Millie was lost. The beautiful scenery now became a terrifying maze. As the sun went down, Millie began to realize she would be spending that night alone in the wild. I was kind of relieved knowing that I didn't have to hike anymore. I was worried that my husband would be worried, but other than that, it felt like I would be okay. That first night, it, it was terrible. I didn't get any, get any sleep at all that first night. I walked the floor and tried to watch a little TV, and I couldn't even do that. Search and rescue teams sprang into action the next morning. But an entire day in the wilderness yielded nothing, not a single clue. Millie faced another night in the bitter cold. I know the first night I spent a lot of time praying that my husband wouldn't worry. The next night, when I was still there, and I was cold, and I was thirsty, and I, I sort of said, well, at least, at least he's warm, he's got a coat. At least he has water. And I sort of started praying for myself that I would get, you know, get out of there. Day two, concern was mounting. How many 30-degree nights could Millie survive? Authorities pulled out all the stops. Additional search teams and mounted patrols were recruited from neighboring counties. Helicopters equipped with infrared sensors took to the skies. But it was as if the earth had opened up and swallowed Millie McGregor. By the end of the second day, we still had no clue no footprints, no drop clothing, no hits from the dog. Uh, there was no sign of Mildred. With an army of searchers unable to find Millie McGregor, it seemed a tragedy in the making. But no one counted on a soft-spoken cowboy named Randy Spears riding to the rescue. Randy lives in the area. However, he says that he was so busy that week, he wasn't aware that Millie was lost until the evening of the second day of searching. What's he going to use that for? Well, there's a lady that's lost up in uh, Cisco Grove. She's been up there lost, I think, for a couple, two or three days. And he's part of the search and rescue. There's a lady that's lost? Yeah. But I don't know where she's at. Randy says that in his mind's eye, he envisioned the silhouette of a Sierra Peak located around 50 miles from his ranch. Though he had never had any kind of psychic experience, Randy somehow knew with absolute certainty that he would find Millie on the mountain's southern slope. Just flashed like big screen TV. It was like I got this picture of a mountain with my hand in front of it, and I just said, I know right where she's at. It was something you didn't mess with. You know, you didn't doubt him. There was a real strong feeling around him. Even though it was well past midnight, Randy collected his friend Frank Smith and headed for the mountains. It's coming close, we're getting there real close now. Randy just looks up there and he goes, she's right up there. He put his hand up there and just, just pointed to her exactly in a certain area on the side of that mountain. He goes, she's right there. She's right there. Meanwhile, Millie hunkered down for a third night of withering cold. That night, I gathered up pine needles and just kind of uh, put them all around when I could. I even put some in my hat, helped keep my head warm. I had an extra pair of socks, so I put those on my hands. Well, of course, the night was very, very long. It was like minute by minute. You know, the moon come up, and. You watch and watch, and pretty soon the moon goes down, and then it gets colder when the moon goes down. It got dampish, and uh, it was cold, real cold. That night, Randy and Frank also slept under the stars. They were up at the crack of dawn. First stop, the search command center. But it was a little strange because they all kind of looked at us like, who are these guys? Because we didn't have the orange vests and all the fancy search gear that they had. It was just a couple of scruffy-looking cowboys with long-eared mules. It was a job, and it was just an, 
something that uh, we were going to do. There was absolutely no no guessing or anything. He, he knew where she was at, and we we're going to go get her. By now, Millie hadn't seen food or water for three days. I was not real strong at that time. I was shaky, and it was like every step I prayed. And I kept picturing in my mind a glass of cold water and a bathtub. 45 minutes of riding took the cowboys three miles from the command center. Randy says he sensed they were getting close to Millie. He and Frank separated to cover a wider area. Randy just kept going, and I watched him go up. I mean, he was just on a light beam, just straight. Well, I was kind of thinking, now what do I do? And I saw Randy coming up on the mule. Help! Help! And it was spectacular. Must be the lady that lost. It was just like he appeared there like magic. Just unbelievable. Oh. There you go. I really needed that. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Good to see you. Yeah. I was amazed that she was, after three days up there yeah. in that cold weather, right. okay. to see her standing up. I know three days out of, myself out there would have darn sure been tough. And for a lady, she has, she has a, a lot of spirit. Thanks to Randy's vision, Millie's harrowing brush with death ended in a triumphant ride down the mountain. At the command center, the sight of Millie and her rescuers created quite a stir. Most of the guys kind of stood around speechless, thinking that that can't be Mildred. We're still looking for her. We have a million dollars worth of equipment out there and resources, and she's coming back to camp on the back of a mule. I probably looked like I was 100 years old, but it felt great. I don't know why it happened and why Randy was picked or and Frank, too, and I pray for them because I think God used them. I don't know any other way of explaining it. I'm not even going to try because that's that, to me, feels right. Randy Spears, a quiet, unassuming cowboy, perhaps blessed with a vision that guided him through the wilderness straight to Millie McGregor. Some may call it luck, but to Randy and Millie, it was nothing less than a divinely inspired revelation. Next Friday marks the start of an all-new season here at Unsolved Mysteries. Tune in for these intriguing cases. In the 1960s and 70s, an unknown killer called the Zodiac terrorized Northern California. In the 1980s and 90s, the infamous Unabomber terrorized the nation. Now a startling scenario. Could the Unabomber and the Zodiac be the same man? When young Trish Zemba was struck by a debilitating nerve disorder, doctors said only a miracle could save her from a lifetime of pain. And Trish believes one did. Join me next Friday for all this and much more on the exciting season premiere of Unsolved Mysteries.